welcome to the today's chairperson, co-chairperson, and all the honorable speakers. Let us give them a warm welcome by a big hand. Thank you very much. Very warm good morning to the dignitaries on the dais of the dais. This is the seventh working session of this memorable International Lawyers Conference. In this seventh working session, the subject which will be discussed, the changing landscape criminal law. The chairperson of this session is Honorable Mr. Justice Surya Khan Sahib, Judge Supreme Court of India. Let us welcome by giving him a quick hand. The co-chairman of the session will be Honorable Mr. Justice Prashant Kumar Mishra, Judge Supreme Court of India. Welcome to Honorable Chairman and a co-chairman of the session. Honorable Speaker of this session will be Honorable Mr. R.S. Chima, former Advocate General and a senior advocate. The other honorable speaker is Mr. Ramakan Sharma, senior advocate and the chairman of the Bar Council of Bihar. The learned speaker of the session will be Mr. Amit Desai, senior advocate from a Bombay High Court. Mr. Siddhartha Luthra, Senior Advocate from the Supreme Court of India, and Mr. Dayan Krishnan, the Senior Advocate of the Delhi High Court. On behalf of the Bar Council of India, I welcome all these honorable dignitaries who will be delivering their speech, and of course, welcome to all the senior advocates, the leaders of the bar coming from entire country, the young advocates, the students of the law. I will take a privilege to welcome Honorable Mr. Justice Surya Khan Sahib by presenting a memento, bouquet, and a shawl. And I will request the member of a Bar Council of India, Sri Pratap Singh, to kindly present a memento, bouquet, and shawl. Welcome to Justice Surya Khan, sir, under whose leadership we have also started a very innovative project of the International India International University of Law at Goa. May I take a privilege to welcome Honorable Mr. Justice Prashant Kumar Mishra, Judge Supreme Court of India, and I will request the Honorable Member from a BCI, Shri Dubey sir, to please come forward. 
and present the memento shawl and bouquet to honorable mr justice prashant kumar mishra welcome sir thank you sir i'll take a privilege to welcome mr r s chima former Advo advocate general and the speaker of this procession and i will request a member bar council of india rami reddy sir to present a bouquet and a memento to sir, honorable sri r s chima sir Uh, I request Honorable Mr. Vishwajit Kumar Mishra, Advocate of Patna High Court, to come on a dais and welcome Mr. Ramakant Sharma, Senior Advocate and a Chairman of Bar Council of Bihar. Welcome, sir. May I request the former chairman of the Bar Council of Maharashtra and Goa to come on a dais and welcome honorable speaker of this session, Mr. Amit Desai, senior advocate from a Bombay High Court. Welcome, sir. Thank you, sir. I'll take a privilege to welcome Mr. Siddhartha Luthra, Senior Advocate from the Supreme Court of India, and I'll request the former Chairman of the Bar Council of Maharashtra and Go Advocate Avinash Bide to come on a dais and a present a memento and bouquet to Mr. Siddhartha Luthra, sir. May I request the member Bar Council of India, Shri A. Rama Reddy, to present a memento and bouquet to Mr. Dayan Krishnan, Senior Advocate, Delhi High Court. Thank you very much. And without taking much time, I will uh, hand over the charge of this session to Honorable Chairman of the session, Honorable Mr. Justice Surya Khan, sir, to have a deliberation, discussion, and of course, your interaction with the subject, the changing landscape criminal law. Thank you very much. Good morning to everyone. Besides my brother Justice uh, Prashant Mishra, just Supreme Court of India and a very distinguished panel of 
the stalwarts in criminal law on my left and right side we have learned attorney general of india with us professor c rajkumar vice chancellor op jindal university is also here very senior advocates representing almost all the states in country are present the young lawyers the students are also there as we know the subject of this panel discussion is the changing landscape of criminal law it's a very wide and open subject but very critical for the society for the nation i personally feel that we need to have a very brief journey that how the very concept of criminal law came to be invented in the society how it developed during the period when india was known as a country with golden era what happened then in subsequent regimes and what was the concept of criminal law when we were divided into small groups without a concept of a larger society and how the contours of criminal law changed and how we accepted the dharma as a law and how we evolved a dand niti all these issues do arise when we deliberate upon the changing landscape of criminal law we have as we know most of the criminal laws enacted pre independence but then india has never left behind with the changing societal norms international standards our commitment to human rights and most importantly our constitutional commitments all these acknowledgments have been duly incorporated in the criminal law from time to time through various modifications amendments repeal replacements all the changes have taken place we have also been extremely concentrate about the marginal sections of the society the vulnerable sections women and children maybe we, we are one of the jurisdictions where through the formally amendment through crpc we have acknowledged legislatively the rights of the victims some of the most significant legislations india can feel proud of is like nirbhay act juvenile justice act of 2015 that shows our legislative intentment and our commitment for rehabilitation instead of following the old and a slowly obliterating concept of punitive or retaliation at the same time we have been trying hard to strike balance between the victim on one hand the right of the society to live peacefully on the other and that no crime should go unpunished this combination of legislative intentments judicial interpretation and the expectation of the society at large have been successfully matched in due course of time by us several amendments in the penal provisions from time to time are witness to it 
that we have always responded to the need of the society in a change scenario. Eventually, we have now a new set of proposed legislation also. Since it's still in the formation stage, it may not be may be appropriate on my part to speak on it or I and my brother may not like to speak on it because it's yet to formally to be shaped into an enforceable law. But then this is how the concept of criminal law as a moral code evolved and accepted by the society to govern itself commencing from the smaller group and emerging into a larger society, followed by the rulers, then followed by the pre-independence rulers, and eventually adopted and accepted by all of us through the constitutionalism and various enactments, how it has shaped the long journey and how it has traveled to respond to the need of the society, I think that is what we are required to deliberate upon and maybe evolve some new ideas which can be helpful to all the stakeholders in formation or in carrying out the necessary changes in the criminal law jurisprudence. With these opening remarks, I would uh, request my brother Justice uh, Prashant Mishra to say a few words on it. My esteemed brother Justice Surikant, the eminent panelist, the stalwarts in the field, learned uh, attorney general, all vice chancellors, uh, members of Bar Council of India, respected lawyers and law students, Brother Justice Surikant has very erudately introduced the subject and we'll be discussing henceforth. We have with us all the stalwarts, much sought after lawyers in the country. But nonetheless, uh, the subject chosen for this session by the Bar Council of India, the changing landscape of criminal law, is one of the most burning topic and burning subject in the landscape of Indian jurisprudence, legal jurisprudence. <coughs> the fine balancing between the needs of the victim, needs of the accused for a fair trial, and then the needs of the society and the needs of the state as a whole has to be so finely balanced that none of the stakeholder in these criminal trials should think that justice is not done to us. Much often, when we lean towards the liberty of the accused and other rights of a fair trial of an accused, there's a growing thinking amongst the victims and the society that they have been cornered in the whole system and zeal to do justice to the accused. And that is where our job becomes slightly difficult. And in these days when the law is changing, the method of committing crime is changing, the method of investigation is also changing. So every day we are faced with new challenges as to how to deal with those accused who are committing crime in a very, very, very sophisticated way. And the Providence of Evidence Act 
vis-a-vis -vis the electronic evidence, those have to be discussed by all of us so that in the eventual analysis, the victory is of justice and not of an individual. The system has to, one system has to overpower the individuals. We have to try hard to evolve a criminal justice system which is so finely balanced that the needs of all the sections of the society is taken care of and uh, we think with the robust criminal justice system this country has since time immemorial as um, um, Honorable Justice Surikant has pointed out. We have all the resources, capacities and talents on all sides of uh, society to deal with such a situation and uh, learned panelists would throw light on this. Thank you so much. And thank you, Bar Council of India, for organizing such a great international conference. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Brother uh, Prashant Mishra. As we understand, the landscape of criminal law is a, is a state of perpetual transformation. So we will request Mr. R.S. Seema, senior advocate, whom I have seen for decades uh, dealing with uh, all kinds of criminal cases and at a time when we didn't know even how to draft a bail application, we will request him to enlighten us on the subject and uh, uh, I will request the audience that be ready for your uh, uh, questions and your queries also because uh, eventually this is an interactive session. We would like to have uh, uh, the thought processing from your side as well. Honorable Justice Surikant, Judge Supreme Court, Honorable Justice Prashant Kupar Mishra, G. Honorable Judge Supreme Court, the galaxy of my colleagues who humble me by their presence, the country's most distinguished law educationists, the Attorney General of India, who I hold in high respect, and my friends. I think we have uh, very limited time, and I'll make a few key points. In the morning, my friend Amit Desai said, you are working too much. So I thought I'll give a reply to him while you are all present. In 2011, we were both, besides other colleagues of ours, councils in 2G. And I think Amit will recall, we persuaded the legendary Ram Jait Malani to conduct a cross-examination. And he conducted the cross-examination of PW7 Acharya Ji with our assistance. And I think that was his last cross-examination. He was 84 at that time. So when he asked me, you are working too much, I believe one change we must all make, me particularly, we should now work to pay back to the society. That is one <laughs> lesson I do. Now, second question has always been elusive. What is our expectation from a criminal court and criminal law? As Honorable Justice Surikant said, a moral code. Everybody looking at it from his viewpoint, there's one story which has become apocryphal in my high court, which I want to share with you, which raises the core question for me. The presiding judge was an ICS turned into judiciary, Justice Dullar, a brilliant judge. The arguments were heard in a division bench appeal. The death sentence was upheld. That you know at that time was the normal sentence. And while the judges were about to rise, a woman stood up, a rural woman. She wanted to speak. The staff tried to take her away. Justice Durla said, let her say what she wants. Now, these sentences I have always carried in my mind. The lady said, motiyan wale ho, insaaf nahi hoya. Blessed judges, justice has not been done. But the reply which came, 
continues to disturb me and should continue to disturb all of us he said bibi asi kaun hai insaaf karne wale asi ta faisle karde ha respect respectable lady we are no one to decide we only have to do justice we only do take decisions we only decide this was incidentally recalled by mr dulat san in his recent memoirs but the point was missed the point is do we have a system which enables the judge the lawyer and all concerned to reach the truth that the mismatch between the justice and the decision is if not eliminated at least minimized and i'll only make a few short points because i want this to be an interactive session i am raising concerns i am saying our landscapes need to change supreme court has been laying down the foundations drawing the road map but there are deep concerns which continue and which threaten to derail the entire system i'll start with the areas in the high court where i usually practice punjab and haryana the division bench appeals are pending since 2003 that is a gap of 20 years imagine a man convicted somewhere in 1995 to 98 <laughs> granted bail 10 years later now going back if he is convicted and the areas are mounting i am giving one example because not even 50 appeals are being heard in the course of an year so one aspect to which i draw everybody's attention here and i think probably we lawyers the honorable judges bar council most of all has to see that we take steps to cut this down the second concern which we all very widely share is the bail large scale detention in of pre trial prisoners is becoming the rule and this detention is coming not because the judiciary is not following the dynamics of various judgments which came over the years because statutes are being amended and introduced which take away the courts right to grant bail these are twin conditions these twin conditions are creating terribly anomalous situations you have a man in 420 who's granted anticipatory bail in the scheduled or the main offense because it falls in section 41 he is rotting in jail in the ed matter in the same case we have hundreds of chartered accountants today in jail their bails having been denied because of the amended indian companies act section 2 12 which introduces serious fraud investigation office and imagine the offenses are punishable up to 7 years up to 10 years and what pains me as a lawyer as a citizen is if we recall gurbakh singh se bia it is the foundational judgment not on anticipatory bail which addresses it is a foundational judgment on the right of bail itself and their lordships start with examples of british india a calcutta judgment emperor versus nagender and two alabad judgments emperor versus hutchinson and joglekar versus the emperor the last two judgments are merit conspiracy case we were under a colonial regime an imperialist power was running the show and the sections were waging war against the state 124a as well and it is at that time the courts held the three cardinal principles that an accused is assumed to be innocent till it's held otherwise that an accused is in a much better position to defend himself when he is on bail that bail is an integral part of a fair system and bail not jail is the rule now i would call upon all concerned here that we cannot countenance with the situation with which we are going 
and just see another part of it and then move on to the next issue. All these twin condition provisions say the notice of the bail shall be given to the advocate general, uh, sorry, to the public prosecutor. If the public prosecutor opposes the bail, then a reasonable grounds to presume that he has committed the offence, and b that he shall not commit any offence if released on bail. Both vague, both susceptible to negative interpretation. No nutshell kindly see who has the authority to grant bail then sir it is the public prosecutor if he doesn't oppose bail then only can you get bail so that is the second concern i think we carry and i would even expect the bar council of india to come in a petition we the position in post constitution independent india cannot be worse than the position of bail in a colonized country, which it was. We didn't have Article 21, we didn't have Article 14. So therefore, that is the second concern, which I feel must bother all of us. The third is, as my lords noted, the sentencing part, the Juvenile Justice Act. <coughs> juvenile Justice Act was the one which went the farthest. Now, we lawyers are also guilty here. Kindly read the judgments. I am speaking from the point of view of trial. Read the judgments today of the magisterial courts. Read the judgments of the sessions courts in trial. You will be finding the judgment silent on the question of probation, be it the Probation of Offenders Act or Section 360 or 361. Completely. I remember when we joined practice in the late 70s, new CRPC had come. The final court had been commenting on, in Vishnu Day court examined 361 CRPC and said that the requirement is he shall be entitled to probation unless it is, there are circumstances to show that he is incapable of being redeeming our reform. The entire reform theory we have put at the back burners on considerations where we do not read our own law. I'll just passingly give one illustration. One of the offenses under the old code is 304A. It's a rash and negligent act. It actually doesn't apply to driving only, but in practical cases, it's only driving which is there. And we have judgments now saying no probation in 304A. And look at the irony. 304A does not require mens rea. So an individual case might have all kinds of ramifications. That's therefore, on sentence, we need, and I would call upon the Bar Council of India to have workshops, to have projects, so that we facilitate the judiciary in this matter. We have changed very little. We are very sporadic. We are also very inconsistent in sentences. The other part, now on Juvenile Justice Act, we introduced some dynamic things which we have not been able to do. I'll just share some practical experiences. A juvenile has to be segregated from the other criminal. What we, what we saw in Chandigarh is the juvenile was one. He couldn't be kept in Bodal jail. The poor fellow is in a solitary confinement in a one-room tenement. So we are doing the reverse of what should be done. Then the set of <coughs> sentences which we need to introduce, which my Lord referred to, community service, other methods, I think we have to harness the civil society. This entire exercise is a matter of execution. And the other two points I'll very briefly mention, access to justice. We had the legal aid system. We have now introduced a very important system of enrolled defense lawyers. But I think we need very massive infusion of funds if we want equity, if we want to create a level playing field, field on this side of law. And since I started with public prosecutors, the last point I'll make is on public prosecutors. 
PMLA confer such big power on public prosecutor, I said. I was special public prosecutor, PMLA, for a few years in coal matters, appointed by the Apex Court. The Enforcement Directorate has no regular cadre of public prosecutors. Similarly, the Ministry of Corporate Affairs, which now operates this SFIO, does not have a regular cadre of public prosecutors. My mind immediately goes to USA, where a public prosecutor is a powerful, dynamic entity. And why he is relevant? One method of elimination of areas in a changing society is plea bargaining. The USA public prosecutor is empowered very widely. So we need tall, highly salaried, highly qualified public prosecutors. So these are different areas we'll have to touch if we have to grapple with the situation and see that the landscape changes as it ought to be. With these words, I am thankful to the chair and all my friends. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chima. Uh, really pointed out very uh, the areas of uh, grave concern for all and one, uh, whether it's areas or the plight of bail, the sentencing, and of course the access to justice is something uh, really, uh, again, very important issue. And uh, the lastly about the uh, public prosecutors, uh, the method of uh, their encaderment and uh, the very high responsibility that lies on the shoulders of a public prosecutor. Uh, we'll request all of you to be ready to uh, your responses, your viewpoint on these questions. We will uh, very soon revert back to that. Meanwhile, I will uh, request uh, Mr. Makan Sharma, uh, Senior Advocate, uh, Chairman of the Bar Council of uh, Bihar, uh, to very briefly in a few minutes, maybe five minutes or four or five minutes, uh, please uh, just give your uh, bullet points on the uh, subject of the uh, deliberations and then we'll proceed on question answer issue. Honorable Justice Surya Kant Sahib, Honorable Mr. Justice Prashant Kumar Misra Sahib, a legal luminary, a legend, Chima Sahib, Desai Sahib, Luthra Sahib, known to everybody in India, Dayan Shankarji, sitting here. I can see most of my friends from Bihar State Bar Council of the Dais and our learned Attorney General first row right hand side and left side the vice chancellor of ILUR. I am shaking in my shoes by seeing the legal luminaries here on a topic. Still I am standing before all of you to share my views. Everybody part of this august evolving landscape of criminal justice. Ever evolving, I can say, criminal law in India, it is both an honor and a responsibility to address this topic. Over the, over the years, India has evolved significant changes in the criminal justice system, driven by societal, technological, and legal developments. These changes have had far-reaching implications, both positive and challenging, and it is essential for us to understand and adapt to this evolving landscape. One of the most notable shifts in Indian criminal law has been the increasing emphasis of protecting the rights of accused. This change in the line with international human rights standards and the fundamental principles of justice. The introduction of safeguards such as the right to legal counsel, 
the right to remain silent and the presumption of innocence until proven guilty has been instrumental in ensuring fair trials and preventing wrongful convictions. Historically, our legal system predominantly focused on the accused, often overlooking the rights and concern of the victims. However, recent legislative changes, amendments and judicial decisions have recognized the importance of providing support and protection to victims. This includes measures such as victim compensation, legal aid, and counseling service to ensure a more compassionate and holistic approach to criminal justice. Ladies and gentlemen, furthermore, technology has played a pivotal role in the shaping the landscape of the criminal law. The advent of digital evidence such as emails, text messages, and social media interactions has revolutionized this way cases are investigated and prosecuted. It has also raised questions about the privacy and security of individuals, as well as the admissibility and authenticity of digital evidence in court. Another noteworthy development is the utilization of technology in criminal investigation and court proceedings. With the advent of digital forensic surveillance technologies and data analytics, law enforcement agencies now have powerful tools at their disposal to gather evidence and solve crimes. However, this has also raised concern about privacy and the potential for abuse requiring a delicate balance between the enforcement needs and individuals' rights. Moreover, the laws surrounding cyber crimes, cyber bullying have evolved to address the growing threat of online misconduct. India's Information Technology Act 2020 has been amended to include provisions for tackling cyber crimes, ensuring the individuals and business, businesses are protected in the digital realm. In recent years, there has been growing awareness and discussion about criminal justice reforms in India. The need for a speedy trial process has gained prominence, driven by realization that lengthy trials often result in delayed justice and overcrowded prisons. The introduction of alternative dispute resolution mechanism, plea bargaining, and the establishment of fast track courts are some of the measures aimed at addressing this issue. Furthermore, the changing landscape of criminal law has also seen a shift towards discriminalization of certain offenses. Decriminalization of certain offenses. For instance, the Supreme Court historic verdict in 2018 decriminalized consensual homosexual relation a significant step towards recognizing and protecting the rights of the LGBTQ community. This demonstrates the evolving social values and the judiciary commitment to aligning with them. The role of social media and the internet is, is shaping criminal law cannot be underestimated. Harassment, cyberbullying, and the dissemination of fake news have become pressing concern. As a result, laws related to cyber crimes and online offenses have been updated to address these emerging challenges, however, ensuring that those laws do not stifle freedom of speech and expression remains an ongoing challenge. While these developments are commendable, it is crucial to acknowledge the challenge that persists in the criminal justice system the backlog of cases, slow judicial process, overcrowded prison continue to be pressing issues that need attention. Reforms are required to ensure timely and efficient justice delivery while upholding the principles of fairness and due process. Another significant change has been the growing awareness and activism ground gender-based violence and the subsequent amendment to laws dealing with sexual offenses. The Nirbhaya case in 2012 served as a catalyst of legal reforms that have extended the legal framework for addressing sexual assault and harassment. These changes are steps in the right direction towards creating a safer and more equitable society. Additionally, the recent repeal of the Article 370 at Jammu and Kashmir has brought about a change in the jurisdiction and applicability 
of Indian criminal laws in that region, highlighting the dynamic nature of our legal system. The role of public awareness and legal education cannot be ignored. Vice Chancellor of our IOLR is here. In the changing landscape of criminal law in India, it is imperative that citizens are aware their rights and responsibilities with the legal framework, legal literacy program, seminars, and campaign play a crucial role in fostering a better understanding of law and its implication. The changing landscape, the word use is very sensitive. The changing landscape of criminal law in India reflects our commitment to justice, human rights, and adapting to contemporary challenges. As criminal lawyer, we, we must continually educate ourselves and advocate for reforms that ensure a fair, efficient, and human criminal justice system. While waiting in the waiting room for honorable judges to come, I met the legendary Chima Sahib. This type of senior citizen who is determined that he has nothing to earn now, he has to serve the country, serve the nation, propose the things, beneficial to the people. Something deliberated in waiting room. When you say that bail will be granted to a juvenile, go and approach the court, juvenile justice court, but not in a statutory way. While you are keeping a juvenile in a confinement where you are keeping 200 criminals in a wards and secluded the juvenile in a single room. Now, what the changes are the principles of justice, fairness, human rights, and we continue to evolve let us remain committed to building a criminal justice system that is both effective and just for all. I am missing if I don't discuss. Now, was saying that proposed rewriting of the code, RPC, CRPC evidence, I don't even want to say because it is a proposed law, and old, better new people say that. But I say respectfully to this audience, this amendment, Indian criminal justice system for more than 150 years, the old system, it is said to be replaced by Bharatiya Nyaya Sangita. The CRPC of 73 will be replaced by Bharatiya Nagar Suraksha Sangita, whereas the Indian Evidence Act will be replaced by Bharatiya Saksh Bill, as we all know. From 1860 up to the date 23, 2023, the country's criminal justice system functioned as a law by tradition. With these three laws, there will be major change in criminal justice system in the country, as has been said by our Honorable Home Minister, Sri Amit Shah Sahib. Since we are in paucity of time, I cannot say more. About this rewriting of the course, some certain comments came in the newspapers like Hindu and other newspapers. But what is better in this reform, just I will assertion that these men are draconian compared to their previous actions lacks merit. This comment is not correct. Instead, the bill exhibits several modern native modifications, including linguistic adjustment for gender inclusivity and replacement of how to detect terms such as insanity with mental illness. There is also a major configuration in the punitive degree for minor and serious offenses. Significantly, the integration of ICT applications in the criminal justice process is noteworthy. Although the scope is limited, innovation such as trial is essential, and the introduction of community service of India decision, notably the often 
purpose of city has been judicially tempered to prevent misuse, facilitated by introducing a test for criminal intent, newly created offenses such as terrorism, organized crime, mob lynching, and negligent acts adds no. opportunity was given to me by the Bar Council of India, particularly the chairman, my two friends, all Bar Councillors of Bihar are here. This privilege I deserve for the simple reason that I am the chairman of the Bar Council of India here. From Bihar. Thanking you all. That you have definitely heard me. Thank you, Mr. Sarmakan Sharma. You have really uh, flagged some of the important issues of concern about constitutional protections. Then you are referred to the uh, technology, and uh, with reference to that, uh, I think you were referring to the IT Act of 2000, where we have some some provisions with regard to the cyber crime. Uh, the In, I'm sorry to say this, a liberty oriented court and another court which is more, let us say, uh, conservative. And the individual doesn't know why I out and why is the other. And the same thing with the victim. The victim feels why is an accused out in my case and not in others. And that takes into the issue of pre trial detention, but that's another topic meant for a whole day conference, not for one day, not for two minutes. The third thing I want to talk about is sentencing. Are we clear in our minds whether it's deterrence, retribution, or reformation, as Srimad Khan spoke? Or should we not be clear? There needs to be much thought on these areas for a society which talks about an involving society 
which is looking at the 21st century as a leader of the world. For that society, I believe, rehabilitation, reformation is very important. Our judges talk of it all the time, but does it really work out that way is the question to be asked. And in all of this, I say to you, there is also time, as the Attorney General mentioned, has mentioned to me in the past, for a National Institute of Criminal Justice Administration where we talk and debate these issues because it is time for us to bring this debate to the fore. These four are very important, but we must make it an institutionalized mechanism where we have greater understanding. In the passing, I'm going to just mention one thing, being a member of NAWSA, so you spoke about the uh, defense uh, advocates that have been brought into Sushima. We brought in, I'm a member of NAWSA, we brought in as the pilot project in 17 districts. Now we are implementing all over the country, and you will see a change, at least in terms of providing legal aid to individuals. Now the second thing I want to speak about very quickly is, we have data from the NCRB, but it is coherent. Is it coherent? In uh, in court time, we talked about people in prison. So we had data which the Honorable Supreme Court used of 2018. But that talked about the people in jail at one point of time, not the people going in and out. Not five lakh people are not the people in jail. They may be at one point of time, but there's a lot more going in and out. And therefore, we need to see how long are people spending <coughs> and in how many crimes. And it's so wide. So while we have data today, and there is the NCRB has done a good job especially in this 2021 report. We need data which is which has greater dimensions for us to have a greater understanding of the operations of the criminal justice system. We need to have legal audit works of our legislation. Does the legislation brought in today work out five years, ten years later? How many convictions, how many sentences are there from the rule of evidence of procedure? And if so, should we not be should we not be requesting the legislature to look at it? Thirdly, we live in a world of technology. Technology and the interface of law and criminal law is something which is very important. We have seen trials being conducted in this country also, now with the use of technology. But there is another aspect of technology, and that's the changing facets of cybercrime. Social media, call it free speech, call it, I won't call it hate speech, I'll call it hostile speech. Do I have the privilege not to be defamed, and if so, what's my remedy? These are matters which must engage the criminal justice system because the criminal law remedy is sometimes the preferred remedy, and as a practitioner of criminal law, I'm not to blame. There are concerns of what the social norms and attitudes, how we perceive our society has changed. There is India, as we call it, and then there is Bharat. But the Bharat is evolving faster than India. India may still be stuck. The urban society may still be stuck in a certain place, but the Bharat is evolving. And how is it evolving? When you see every child with access to a digital phone, to a hand phone, and see the kind of material he or she can access or propound or, or see or send out, it is an alarming situation. I'm not saying there's a need for great regulation, but there's a need for understanding how our society is changing. We talk about reform, but one of the things we must talk about reform also is the execution of our criminal justice system. Judges are supposed to be and act as umpires in ensuring that there's a fair trial in our adversarial system. But what are we doing about scientific investigations? As late as last week, I have had occasion to assist the Honorable Supreme Court in a death penalty case where three people were committed. So I asked myself this question. Can I advise them today? It was a specifically legal aid matter to Project 39. Can I ask them today to go back and claim compensation? I can't. They may not death penalty two of them for more than a decade. Do we have a remedy to compensate those who unjustly put to prison, whose liberty is lost, whose reputation is lost? The answer clearly is no. There is a law commission report which made some recommendations, but nothing. And I would really say that this is time for us to look at scientifically oriented investigations. Technology must be used as a tool to ensure 
that the innocent are not prosecuted. Not, I'm not about punished, but they are not even prosecuted. I think. Two more things, and I will wind up. The way forward is use technology in a investigations in the way we carry out our criminal law processes in the future years. Use technology in the way we resolve people. For example, bail. Why can't we have electronic collars so a person can be released but the monitor? Today your mobile phone is the biggest monitoring you have. The electronic collar will work like that. If we can use it for drugs, I don't know if you know, every commercial drug shop has two chips so that anywhere in the country it can never get lost. It will be it. Why can't we use that if you want to keep people back in our jails? It may be a restraint on liberty, but it's better than using jail. So the way forward is technology, but we must also keep looking at it when we look at things like facial recognition, uh, linguistic translation, voice recognition, we must also be sensitive to the privacy issues of an individual and the biases that may enter technology. After all, AI is not without biases, it will have the biases of the individual. So bias Reduce technology is what we should aim to ensure fairness in our criminal justice system. <coughs> there is of course hope because as you may be aware, the government of India is recently looking at poor prisoners, the Ministry of Home Affairs, the DOG has done extensive work trying to reach and make these programs, which is very, very important for our criminal justice system. I will just leave you with one thought. We are at an important stage in our social development where we are transitioning and we may even be transitioning to new laws. The new laws have a lot of interesting things. But we will have to see if we bring in harsher laws, reverse burdens, are we doing justice to our society? Are we not diluting the presumption of innocence? Which, we, which has been a hallmark of Article 21 of our criminal justice system. So any law that must come must be sensitive to the, I would call it not the couple, because the penal couple is the victim of the case, but the penal trial society, the accused and the victim. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mukhtar. Commenced with the lack of violence in criminal justice system, and when you have to explain the inconsistency, sometimes in judicial approach also, the requirement of rehabilitation, reformation, legal audit, terminology, are these very important issues? Now. And what kind of and to what extent the technology can be used for expediting the criminal justice system? Then changing importantly the students of law. Uh, am I sort of audible at the back? Because I think a lot of this is more about the youngsters today who are sitting in this crowd than for me uh, who probably understands very little about what I'm going to talk about. Uh, it's always a pleasure to explore emerging areas of the law with the legal fraternity, the participants in the justice delivery process and the students of the law. And I thank the Bar Council of India for this op opportunity. The landscape of criminal law is vast, complex and changing very fast and I must tell you that what you have seen today is barely the tip of the iceberg and therefore it is next to impossible for us to really uh, undertake any kind of a uh, proper discussion or debate uh, on a subject as vast and critical as this. So I am only going to pick up a few limited aspects of it. Society is evolving at the speed of the currents in the internet ocean. In this 21st century, Transformation is occurring every decade. 
The first decade was the growth of computers and computing after the Y2K fears. The second decade was the explosion of the internet. And now this third decade, we are wondering whether the advent of chat, GBT and AI is bringing the slow death of the search engines which was brought about the growth of the internet. And simultaneously in this same decade is the growth of AI and fake news. So one wonders whether that this space of technological revolution, and some of our, my colleagues have touched upon technological revolutions, uh, uh, in the space of this technological revolution, the next decade will see chat, GBT and internet as we know it being taken over by artificial intelligence and more importantly non-truth. So no conversation or debate on any facet of the law can now not recognize these cataclysmic changes. And criminal law is no exception. In fact, the role of criminal law is crucial for the orderly behavior of society. Justice Surekhan adverted to that in his opening. Truth is supposed to be the journey in a criminal case. And in this context, the landscape is changing and is changing at an extraordinary pace. The jungle is vast and it's too complicated to pass through. And all of which lie in the crucible of the judiciary to judge and enforce. We now live in a world of audacious crimes, audacious surveillance, and audacious technologies, which not only help commit crimes, but provide investigative tools. All these activities are premised upon the access to big data. So if some of you have read Yuval Harari's book, and if you follow him, his recent book, which is 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, portrays a fascinating perspective of the future of human society. At times a bit too frightening, but that's a conversation for another day. But he makes a telling observation, and I quote, In ancient times, land was the most important asset in the world, and politics was a struggle to control land. In the modern era, machines and factories become more important than land, and political struggles focused on controlling these vital means of production. In the 21st century, however, Data will eclipse both land and machinery, and the political struggle will be to control the flow of data. This is the legal challenge we must debate in the dispensation of justice. In fact, today data is the oxygen for criminals and investigative agencies alike. The game of this century is the control of data, and you, he who controls data will control the people. Wars, metaphorically, will be fought over this control. And I'm not here to make any doomsday claims about how AI and chat GPT are the end of free thinking lawyers and the process of judging. Instead, like all tools, I firmly believe that the latest developments and advancements in technology should be something we work with rather than against. However, in order to do so, it's important to understand how the new age technologies affect criminal law. The three areas that I intend to touch upon are data creation, that is a crime, data collection, that is surveillance, and data crunching, which is the sanctity of evidence. So data creation. Crimes in the physical world are being committed in the virtual world. We have seen the growth of cyber terrorism, cyber extortion, cyber theft, cyber fraud, etc. Some of you may recollect the robbery of the Central Bank of Bangladesh a few years ago. It was a remote robbery of nearly about $100 billion by anonymous robbers sitting somewhere far away from Bangladesh and transporting the monies in seconds to places outside of Bangladesh. All this was done through a hack into their swift money transfer system. Just as digital world has spawned the cyber crimes of the early 2000s, the latest developments in AI are being used to harness the data in the digital space to create and commit audacious crimes. The digital space has allowed the anonymization of criminals and since increases the challenges in investigations. So some examples of these audacious crimes that we've seen recently. The Twitter Bitcoin scam of July 2020, and so maybe the youngsters have read about it, I read about it recently, where hackers compromise high-profile Twitter accounts of persons like Barack Obama, Elon Musk, and Bill Gates using artificial intelligence to promote cryptocurrency. A very decent example of AI was AI generated deep fake vocals of a prominent singer by the name Drake. He's a famous rap singer in the world. Which song was nominated for the best rap song and song of the year of the, at the Grammy Awards this year? But Drake said he never lent his voice to that song. 
In India, we have seen Mr. Amitabh Bachchan and Mr. Anil Kapoor obtaining John Doe injunctions from the Delhi High Court, prohibiting persons from faking their voices with deep fake technology. And some of the audacious use of technology are when a politician uses his technology for delivering a speech in a language he could not converse in. Or, in the Bhima Koregao case, where it is alleged that incriminating evidence was remotely introduced in the computer system of some of the accused. It is becoming tougher and tougher to identify certain types of crimes that are perpetrated using AI. For example, a very novel event which happened recently was a woman in Arizona was convinced that her daughter had been kidnapped for $1 million ransom due to the criminals using deep faking technology and faking the daughter's voice. The possibilities are endless. So in the same way that we saw a rise in softwares that could detect if something was generated by chat GBT, companies are working on programs that can identify deepfakes and other false and fake information which is invading the system much more accurately than the human can. This takes me to the second aspect, which is data collection or surveillance. The world is currently digital, that is both physical and digital. But as India becomes a developed nation in its walk to 100 years, it may turn entirely digital. While having a positive implication for innovation, commerce, governance and convenience, these developments throw up a very important question in respect to our newly minted fundamental right to privacy under the Putta Swami case and the need for judicial oversight in the data collection process. You will all be familiar with George Orwell, whose book, 1984, was written in a post-industrial revolution post-World War II, pre-internet revolution, when he said television will watch people and not the other way around. Computers, rockets to outer space and satellites circling the earth were dreams and the internet and artificial intelligence were possibly more comic book stories. He lived in a physical and analog world and warned about an autocratic government watching over every private moment of a citizen's life. He worried about the adage that every man's home is his castle and fortress a proposition settled in Semayan's case in 1684. In 1763, in Huckle versus Money, it was held to enter a man's house by virtue of a nameless warrant in order to procure evidence is worse than the Spanish, Spanish Inquisition. This case held that a magistrate cannot exercise arbitrary powers which violated the Magna Carta. Across the Atlantic Ocean, the US Constitution 250 years ago guaranteed the same rights through the Fourth Amendment the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures. These were constitutionally protected rights, the right against non-interference in one's private life and the right against non-surveillance. But in India, these were not part of our constitution when and as it was framed. Though there was an attempt to include it as a fundamental right, the same was nixed. But the Orwellian world of today is about our castle and fortress having involved to include our computers, mobile phone, social media accounts, and soon, as the youngsters will know in this crowd, our avatar and home in the meta space. Communication is through text messages, WhatsApps, images, gestures, emoticons, memes, and the like. The most private thoughts of the young generation and emotions are being instantly shared through these mediums in the belief of complete privacy. Memories are being downloaded on memory cards. Already the world has mass surveillance programs with AI-linked data analytics. The identity of a person is linked to his face, his retina, the, his retina, his voice, handwriting, fingerprints, and DNA. But today's technology keeps all of this on a server. Your smartphones carry your fingerprint or your face ID. India's own mass surveillance programs are manifold. We have heard stories of illegal surve surveillance from governments, Saudi government alleging surveying Jeff Bozo's phone by hacking his phone or the recent scandal around the use of Pegasus spy spyware by certain governments including Netherlands, Belgium and Germany or illegal tapping of the phones. Consider that nearly 100% of the Indian adult population has a, an Indian population has an Aadhaar card and over 70% of the country has access to smartphones. Imagine that virtually all private actions of the entire population are being captured on real-time basis, forming a large data set that investigating authorities can rely on as part of their process. Surveillance gives the location and nature of evidence in an investigation. 
this can trigger a search and seizure action to collect and recover the evidence. This power is undoubtedly inherent to a successful investigation. Data which previously remained in my head or in my body is now available across the internet. Information that was private to an individual and more importantly privately held by that individual is now held on a server owned by someone else. If access to such server can be made available, uh, can it be said that the individual has consented to the private information being collected by investigating agencies? Should every individual be forced to think twice before sharing their lives with the internet? While the debate on collection of evidence through the search and seizure power started in the Constituent Assembly in 1949-50, the debate in the Supreme Court began in 1954. In 1954, eight judges and again in 1962, seven judges in Sharma and Karaksin's case considered the issues of search and seizure, surveillance, privacy, criminal investigations and fundamental rights. While negating the elevation of the right to privacy to a fundamental right, it reaffirmed the overriding state power of search and seizure for protection of social security and surveillance. But in 1975, the Matthew, Krishnayar and Goswami court once again examined the issue in the context of surveillance through domiciliary visits and started a journey of leaning in favor of privacy being a facet of fundamental rights, a topic that was also just briefly touched upon. However, the watershed moment in the Indian constitutional history was in 2017 when nine judges of the Supreme Court in Puttuswami held that privacy rights are part of Article 21 of the Constitution and elevated it to a fundamental right. Consequently, privacy the new fundamental right can be invaded only in accordance with the procedure established by law and the law must satisfy the tests not only of Maneka Gandhi's case but the Supreme Court has established the proportionality and legitimacy test. Following this, in 2018, the Aadhaar judgment, five judges struck down some of the provisions of the Act which permitted the use of Aadhaar information for the purpose of investigation. So criminal investigations and criminal justice delivery process will have to bear in mind these new tenets in this new world order of continuing involuntary surveillance. This takes me to data crunching and the sanctity of evidence. With the alarming rise of surveillance tools, what are the checks and balances that must come to bear in the course of appreciation of any information gathered by such surveillance? I have already mentioned giving a few illustrations of the complexities in investigations which arise on account of these new technologies. While there are physical world parallels, the digital nature of these actions forces us to rethink the sanctity of digital evidence. Considering the varying complexity at both ends of the justice system, which is in the use and the misuse of technology, that is deep surveillance into one's personal private matters and also the complex crimes that occur using the technology, the question is how does the judicial process assess the evidence gathered pursuant to such almost limitless surveillance? And these are only some of my personal thoughts on the subject to provoke a debate and a discussion for which I think we are here gathered. Firstly, is the doctrine of evidentiary exclusion uh, principle. In the post Puttuswami era, the question is do we bury or modify the ghost of the Puranmar doctrine. The Puranmar doctrine, which was an income tax case, provides that evidence recovered from an illegal search is admissible but is subject to a greater scrutiny. This was a tax case, but the principle was extended to all types of criminal cases. Is it now time to follow the dictum of Baldev, which in 1999 disregarded Puranmar doctrine in the context of personal search under Section 50 of the Narcotics Act? This was an invasion of personal or body privacy. In Baldev, five judges adopted the fruit of the poisonous tree doctrine. The court observed, and I quote, prosecution cannot be permitted to take advantage of its own wrong. Conducting a fair trial for those who are accused of a criminal offence is a cornerstone of our democratic society. So while considering the aspect of fair trial, the nature of the evidence obtained and the nature of the safeguard violated are both relevant factors. We must also note the caution of Justice Rama Subramaniam in the famous Arjun Pandit Rao case in 2020 while dealing with Section 65B of the Evidence Act which deals with digital evidence. He said, a photo taken with an analog camera can remain a single object. But a photo taken with a digital camera is stored in zeros at once and hence can be manipulated. So, analog maintains the integrity of evidence 
whereas digital has the capability of destroying the integrity of it. Our 65B needs some reconsideration. Technologically advanced nations have experimented with special rules of evidence and have, after realizing the problems, have reverted back to the traditional rules of proof and admissibility. Second thought is the requirement of enhanced form of consent. To the point I briefly mentioned earlier, the elements of consent underlying data seized needs to satisfy a higher standard of admissibility. Consent in accessing electronic data, consent to undergo polygraph tests, consent to undergo narco analysis, consent to provide voice sample, or consent to provide biometrics. All the evidence collected through means of this consent tend to fall in the self-incriminatory doctrine bucket and risk being violative of Article 20 sub Article 3. How is this consent obtained and recorded? If the evidence is obtained through means of involuntary collection of this personal information without consent, how will courts view this evidence in the context of invasion of privacy? Will every investigation fall within the state interest exception? Every time you visit a website and accept a cookie, should that be deemed consent for an investigative authority to override your right to privacy? Thirdly, is the chain of custody rule. The integrity of evidence such as vice and biometrics at the risk of cloning. Documents at the risk of duplication, modification and fabrication. Images are at the risk of being modified or created and digital footprints or foot, uh, fingerprints or footprints are capable of being stolen or erased. Identities are at the risk of theft. Consequently, the chain of custody of evidence collected must be impeccable. So friends, as we stand at the crossroads of technological advancement and legal ethics, let us navigate this path in an internationally collaborative manner with prudence, ensuring that the promise of digital technology and AI in the criminal justice system is realized while upholding justice, fairness, and individual rights. Thank you very much, my friends. Thank you, Mr. Desai. Uh, you have really given a very deep insight of uh, the, uh, it's not only the cyber crime, but uh, all the related, uh, the technology-based uh, issues that are arising uh, and the, which are the, not future, rather the current challenges we have started facing. And uh, the, maybe the deficiencies in the IT Act and uh, maybe that we need to have some more robust uh, uh, legal mechanism for uh, data protection, etc. and all these issues. Of course, uh, right from hacking to legal, illegal tapping and all these very serious issues of uh, whether it's cryptocurrency or uh, these, these are very uh, important uh, uh, grey areas where uh, uh, the difficulty is that uh, these are the offences which, as you rightly pointed out, Bangladesh instance don't have any geographical uh, boundaries and can be committed uh, in, from any part of the world. So how to deal with them, probably you need to have uh, uh, a, a global uh, uh, consensus-based uh, policy uh, to which all the stakeholder countries need to uh, sit together and evolve it. All these issues are very, very interesting issues. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we now uh, request uh, Mr. Dhyan Krishnan uh, to say a few words and then we throw open to the audience. Honorable Justice Surekhan, Honorable Justice Mishra, my friends on the dais, the Attorney General for India, ladies and gentlemen. I want to concentrate a little bit on and take forward what Mr. Desai dealt with and deal with the issues which really confront us in cross-border crime. But before that, I was very interested by the opening remark of Justice Surya Khan, who started by asking us the question as how criminal law evolved. And the changing nature of criminal law, actually jurisprudentially, goes back to the constant tussle between society, trying to keep people within a certain set of norms, and on the other hand, an individual for personal gain or otherwise wanting to break out of these norms. The best theory, as, which is sociological, which we use in jurisprudence is clearly the theory of Emil Durkheim, who used the functionalist theory to say that social regulation, social integration, and social change together force society to evolve and meet 
the challenges by an individual to break out of these societal norms. Now, one area which I also happen to, to practice a fair amount is an area of extradition which faces these changes on a daily basis. The changes really relate to the issues of technological crime. Today, where we were talking about hacking, we are talking about cryptocurrency and the requirement of serious international legal changes. Take, for instance, a common internet crime. On one hand, you have the domain host, which is based in one country, the domain registrar, who is based in another country, the criminal in a third country, and the victim in the fourth country. Now, what is the fundamental challenge that we face in such cases? Either appearing for the government in an extradition or appearing against the government defending an extradition. The challenge is a challenge of jurisdiction. And today in international law, there is no unanimity in jurisdiction. You have the principles of subjective territorial jurisdiction, which is a jurisdiction which is conferred on the country where the criminal conceives or commits the crime. You have the principle of objective territorial jurisdiction, which is the point where the, criminal, the victim faces the crime. You have the principle of nationality, which is a part of the Indian Penal Code in Section 4.1, which says that India will exercise jurisdiction over all its citizens wherever the crime is committed. And the decision and the principle of passive personality, or what we, is the old Roman principle, which America uses in certain statutes, to say wherever my citizen is, I will exercise jurisdiction. But the color view is this. Where is the recognition of a hierarchy of jurisdictions? And this becomes critical when you deal with international crime. Because each country asserts jurisdiction in its own way. And therefore, there is an absolute requirement to come to a global consensus in order to achieve the principle of objective territoriality, that is a victim-centered jurisdiction by way either of international treaty or by way of customary international law. Of course, customary international law will take its own time, but by way of treaty. And our experiences in the post 9-11 era of international crime and cooperation have shown that treaty works very well. Take the example of the MLATs. Today, every Indian investigating agency uses the MLAT. Earlier, we used to get information under the retrogatory regime under 166A of the Code of Criminal Procedure. And all of us know who are on this diet that most of that material never came. And many times when it came, the trials were over. But today, because of the mutual legal assistance treaties, Investigators are able to get material real time. And a great example of international cooperation. But we need a similar regime as far as international jurisdiction is concerned. Now, without doubt, today and the events of the recent past have shown that India is diplomatically powerful. This was not a situation over the years when we faced various reverses in extradition. But this requires both diplomatic as well executive and legislative changes. Take the Indian Extradition Act and compare it with the UK Act of 2003. The UK Act of 2003 has a schedule which is called Category 1 and Category 2 in Part A countries, where if you are notified on reciprocity, there is no requirement of a prima facie case analysis. Today, most of our extraditions are stuck because of long procedures in the United Kingdom, for example, of course it happens in other countries like Spain, etc., where because of the lack of this reciprocity, courts go into an entire analysis of whether a prima facie case is made out. Secondly, executive action is also required. 
The Indian Extradition Act is actually, post its 1993 amendment, an extremely forward-thinking act. It provides in part three of with section 12 for the central government to notify similarly such countries. But if you look at that schedule, it is laughable. The schedules which we, the countries we have notified are Turkey, Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan. I don't believe in my limited experience in extradition that any of our fugitives go to such countries. And the countries where our fugitives run to are countries which are not notified on reciprocity. A classic example of why we need to act in furtherance of le existing legislative framework and international understanding so that cross-border crimes, which is really the evolving nature of crime, is quickly dealt with. Take another issue which arises in extraditions, the issue of jail conditions, human rights record of a country. It's not that the countries where the fugitive is living have any great human rights records. Therefore, these again become a whole loop by which the fugitive continues to remain there. But a good example is the example followed by the United States by using the principle of non-inquiry. The famous United States judgment in Neely versus Henkel way back in 1901 said this, but such citizenship does not give him an immunity to commit crime in other countries, nor entitle him to demand of right a trial in any other mode than what was allowed to its own people by the country whose laws he has violated and from whose justice he has fled. This is again a requirement by way of international consensus that all countries who have democratically elected governments, a robust judiciary, and good investigating agencies must adopt the principle of non-inquiry. So the moment the country says, yes, he has committed a crime in my country, the fugitive must be returned. The last point which I want to raise for your consideration is the problem of enforcement of orders. And this is in the domestic jurisdiction. Very recently, without taking names, I was doing a case relating to a large corporation in the Delhi High Court, whose entire data was taken away by a hacker, who then sought the return of the data for ransom on the basis of payment in cryptocurrency. This is quite common. So both in a civil suit, we got an injunction and a blocking order. In a criminal case, we got an order under Section 69, Capital A of the Information Technology Act. But at some level, both these orders were of no use. The rogue websites never ever come to our jurisdiction. The maximum you can do is the internet service provider would block that website. But as all of you know here, all you require is a VPN or a proxy subscription, where a VPN proxy will take you to that same website. The point I'm making is technology and criminals have gone far ahead of law. The solutions don't rest only with lawyers judges and investigators. The solutions actually also rest with technology and technocrats. But the time has come for us to understand that we need to think globally. Think globally in terms of how we frame our laws, how we do our investigations, and how we need to achieve global cooperation. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Pritchard, that uh, technology and criminals have gone far ahead. The issues of cross-border criminality, extradition of uh, the suspects and all these issues which we face because of lack of unanimity among the different jurisdictions, these are very crucial issues and uh, he may be right in pointing out that there are several uh, white-collar uh, criminals or the other offenders who are taking undue advantage of this kind of situation. 
we hope that the stakeholders will definitely address all these issues and will take uh, some effective measures. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, we are time to stage, but uh, as I promised from the very beginning, we would like to have some uh, uh, brief questions from your side and uh, the panelists will try to respond. Yes, please, one by one. Do we have any? On it, you. You can come up here then. Uh, it, will, uh, it will take time then. Mm -hmm. I am Sharik Ahmed, the practicing advocate in Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Sir, uh, Honorable Chairperson, sir, my query is that in law schools we were taught that the moment SIR is lodged, the criminal law is set in motion. But in few few of the states, and my learned senior colleagues and Lutra would agree, that in some of the states, the moment FIR is lodged, bulldozer is also set in motion. Are we heading towards a legal regime where bulldozer too would be recognized as the most potent way of administering and imparting justice? Thank you. Sir, you have to Unless either we take uh, specific discussion, that will not be possible uh, with the time constraints. Uh, let's discuss the general principles and uh, uh, the broader legal issues. Uh, with regard to reformations and uh, whatever be the changing uh, the landscape of the criminal law, let's confine to that subject. Maybe uh, because people can have different kind of uh, views and issues uh, depending upon the facts and circumstances. So, uh, let's have a general uh, principle based discussion. Yes, please. Those who want to ask questions, I think you can come here and one by one then. Um, good morning, all the esteemed personalities present here. I'm Amalna from Ilo Goa. And my question is, the Criminal Procedure Identification Act of the year 2022 allows the storage of biological samples for over a 75 years period of time. The biological samples such as DNA can be used to procure the whole family lineage. So how the right of privacy of the radical relevant of the accused and the right of the victim to have the detailed investigation can be balanced out as according to the act, the denial of giving the samples is also charged with a criminal consequence. Thank you. The young lady has touched upon <laughs> an issue that really needs to be debated. Uh, undoubtedly, the rights of privacy will have to be balanced with the needs of uh, an investigative agency and it will be fact specific but I do hope that as the matters <laughs> land up because we struggle with, as, as a practicing lawyer, I think we struggle with these kind of issues and I've raised some of these problems for uh, consideration and debate as to how in the Kukuswami regime we will have to balance out this very issue about DNA samples of uh, um, private family members and how will you balance it and admit it into evidence. Uh, I probably have a more conservative view having spent my years as a defense lawyer, but I must recognize that there is a very serious counterpoint that courts have to take into account and in many cases it will evolve based upon a set of facts. I think the broad philosophy will have to be balanced uh, uh, in this context, but I think that's where we'll have to do it. I don't think we have a, uh, a direct answer. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Thank you, sir. I'm asking just about the law adopted by the police as well as the investigation as well as the lower court. I'm practicing in the lower court. Sir, in the judgment of our lowest court versus state of Bihar and the state of Bihar and the versus CBI, the mandatory police and the mandatory directions were going to be held by the Supreme Court, but the police just to provide themselves from the orbit of the these particular judgments, they just write in the FIAR and in the
They are not caring about these debates in the directions where they are able to move out. They are not facing directions about these particular line of the debates. These debates are the overlaps uh, of our institution, and we have to give these overlaps to be the respect. Thank you so much. <laughs> The other expenses which are within seven years are not attractive, and forty-one is forty-one. Until the specific parameters are not attractive. Thank you. Yes, because the permission of the chair, if chair permits me, I want to read it or indicate two interesting amendments in the RTC. If Chair permits me, I want to read uh, that on The proposed amendment in uh, section two, uh, in IPC, while well, 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 the proposed, uh, no, 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 it, in, in, in my view, it is going to change entire justice with the legal system. Please, uh, please, uh, please, uh, please, uh, please uh, if you have some suggestions for the, uh, uh, the proposed uh, new criminal laws, you give your suggestion. No, no, I am I'm not I'm not giving I'm not giving any more suggestion, yes. but I want to I want that this uh, proposed amendment must be discussed among this legal factor. That's only right. so, you please send it uh, we we'll request you to send a detailed mail to BC and if you can give your suggestion because uh, section two fifty five says we have been a public servant corruptly or malicious civil makes or pronounces in any stage of the judicial proceeding, any report, order, verdict, or decision which he knows contrary to law shall be punished with imprisonment. So, these are the suggestions you can give. These are, please don't ask for human things. And, uh, you know, you know, are, I am going to receive the motion, will not be under threat. Okay. After that, then on email. What we will request is that because of the time question, uh, all the orders uh, 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 in the we request you please send your suggestions and your questions to BCI uh, uh, to me and we will. Yes, yes, yes. Lanya Adonis only wants to say something. He is most welcome. So, please. So, it's, it's neither questions nor answers. <laughs> um, I'm here only to listen and take stock of uh, the concerns that have been raised. I've been closely watching some of the issues uh, that have been arising in the past one year. What occurs to me is that uh, we need to structure our interactions. It becomes very ad hoc when we meet occasionally like this. We're not able to take talk of at a very deeper level. So a couple of structural interventions by Leonard from Siddharth Totra had been talking about it. But probably I'll be able to persuade the government through conversations occurring through these conferences that we need to have a National Institute of Criminal Justice Administration. And I am and I want all the vice chancellors here and, uh, and the law school heads and the academicians to take part in this initiative. Because if you're talking about balancing rights, it can't be done only, in, I think, in the court proceeding. It has to be probably guided by a whole set of guidelines and principles and working arrangements. The second is, I'm also contemplating to have a standing conference of advocate generals and the senior advocates from different parts of the high, various parts of the country to keep meeting as often as possible to take stock of what's happening in the criminal justice system and be able to produce voluntary reports to the government. Law Commission will do its job. But this kind of an initiative I thought was also equally important. So I take this opportunity of inviting all the like-minded persons in the field of criminal justice and we will direct appeal to all the advocate journals to take part in a very important initiative. Because recently when I was appearing for a criminal matter and question of narco analysis, whether I can refuse to be subject to a, an investigative, invasive investigative procedure like that, many questions came to our mind. Probably 
one one point of time in the law commission, I was thought thinking that many of the legislation require principles of interpretations part of the legislations, which may guide the courts. Then I thought it's a little naive suggestion. Because very often the courts are confronted with what you may say the principle, DK Basu of that matter. But the courts every day are called upon to read the DK Basu. So perhaps something fundamental can be done to make all the three legislators which have come. Probably we have some kind of a national criminal justice guidelines procedures, which will inform sentencing procedures, which will inform interpretation procedures, and so on and so forth. I am extremely grateful to bring you a very insightful presentation today, first of all, Diane Kishan and the, the global development and how we take stock of the global situation. I'm thankful so much. Uh, thank you, the Learning Attorney General of India, that uh, you for your uh, assurance uh, on, on the two major issues. And I think the initiative of uh, talking to all senior advocates from different parts of the country will be a very welcome step. That will really lead to uh, a coordinated effort in um, uh, the uh, perpetual kind of uh, reformatory steps which we are required to take from time to time. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. What else? It is my turn, what I Good afternoon to everybody on the behalf of Adela Sarja Dayas. It gives me immense pleasure to pay a word of thanks on this second day International Lawyers Conference on how we bar of India. I extend our gratitude to the Honorable Justice Surikant, Judge of Supreme Court of India, today's chairman of this function, Honorable Justice Prashant Kumar Mishra, Judge Supreme Court of India, and the former High Court Judge of our state, Andhra Pradesh, leading the session in a day in a very fruitful way. I would also like to express our gratitude to our esteemed speakers, Mr. R. S. Seema, Mr. Ramakan, Chairman Bar Council of Bihar, Mr. Amit Desai, Senior Advocate, Siddharth Lutra, Dayan Kishan, Senior Advocate of the Supreme Court, who have shared their like, intakes of research of the experiences of contributing to our collective understanding of ever evolving legal and the uh, uh, scape of in global scale. I thank the delegates of the participants who became the best, of, best part of this conference. My special best of blessing to the law students who are the future hope of the Indian legal system as we leave the year today. Let us carry with us a knowledge. Co concluding some of the aspirations uh, of the grain from these who lectures. Together, we can continue to build bridges across borders and promote the values of justice, ethics, and professionalism. Let us remember the strength of the law is its fairness and the power of justice in its equality. Thank you, thank you, and all. Thank you very much for it. Thank you very much. Thank you to everyone. Group for yes.